Hello everybody, I'm Tom Prochet, Director of Electrification for Monroe & Associates. We're here with Monroe Live today to show you the EV9 battery pack. Uh, so this is sort of a continuation of some discussions we've had in the past about the EV9. Uh, my colleague Paul Turnbull did a pretty good video that talked about the merits of this battery. I won't go into those details in hope that you watch his video too. So the things to know about this battery pack is it's of the 800 volt architecture. And if you watch this channel, you know that that doesn't mean a whole lot. It gives you sort of a talking point about its voltage operating range, but it doesn't tell you the actual operating range. So in this case, what it, it mainly means is that it's above 600 volts. And that would be specifically about 643 volts as a maximum down to about 462 as a minimum. And that's if they use the same cell Vmax and cell Vmin that I do in my spreadsheet. So that said, the pack is configured, and we know this from some pre previous experience, that it's got 38 modules in it. So each of these modules is um, identical, and each of them has um, four groups of three cells, as I recall. Let me make sure I'm speaking correctly. That's correct, four groups of three cells. So yeah, that gives you that total voltage operating range I mentioned a moment ago. So we've got some high voltage connections, the stereotypical, they've been uncovered. We usually keep them taped off for uh, shopkeeping, but we know from previous checking that these are all uh, not live connections, so they're safe. Um, that said, you've got a couple of vents here that will allow for the uh, equalization of pressure between the uh, internal of the pack and normal ambient pressure. Uh, we also have some Gore-Tex type vents here that are meant for rather slow equalization of that pressure these for more large flows, such as what you might have during a thermal runaway event. So there's more of those vents in the back, uh, but you always have a combination of those two types of vents and these types of batteries. Uh, these don't flow enough to release the pressure of a, a catastrophic event, but these would, and if they had to, they would blow apart. By the looks of them, that's probably what they do. So that said, you can see some of the configuration of the mounting there are through holes that go right through the center of the back that the pack that are four fasteners that hold the battery to the actual uh, chassis. Same thing with these outside perimeters. So there's quite a few bolts that make this a very rigid assembly when it's installed. Um, the points about this pack that have been covered in the past uh, were covered under the context of maybe the Ionic 5 or the EV6 in that those were very similar packs to this. this pack has a single cooling system underneath it. It is a single cold plate with a single inlet and a single outlet. And um, that's both brilliant and it's a cause for a little bit of a concern there. Um, it makes it very easy to plumb the package. There's a single inlet hose connection and a single outlet hose connection. Um, but it also kind of causes the concern about the aluminum on the bottom that is that cold plate being exposed to the atmosphere. And if you look at this pack, it has a, a, a composite structure over the top or technically on the bottom that provides a thermal insulating function as well as a little bit of a road hazard buffer. You can see the other high voltage connection. Of course, there's a front drive unit and a rear drive unit on this vehicle. So there's one for each plus a low voltage connection, which is where all of your normal control signals and communication uh, connect to the pack. And then, of course, I mentioned the single inlet and outlet for the cooling. So you can see that these uh, fittings connect directly to this cold plate assembly that is the bottom of the pack. And it's not the very bottom. As mentioned, there's also a, a uh, structure underneath there that's made of composite. 
Up on top, you can see we have a number of pieces of foam that serve mostly the purpose of uh, noise vibration and harshness or what we call MVH in the business. So these are ways to keep it from rattling and squeaking. Um, it does not look like it provides any other function than that, in my view at least. So I could be wrong, but this is what we know about the battery before we take it apart. So here's the underside of the pack. As mentioned before, you have this giant aluminum cold plate on the very bottom of the, the battery pack assembly. But in our plain view here is a composite device that serves a couple of unique purposes. Uh, one big one, as we see it, is that the ambient envi environment gets hot, it gets cold, and the aluminum very easily couples into that ambient environment. And if you're trying to heat your battery and it's cold outside, that works against you as the ambient heat tries to cool your cold plate. So this provides a thermal insulating layer that gives you at least some isolation from the ambient environment. Also of interest underneath here, there are some user serviceable components. I say user quite loosely, dealership use, uh, if you will, mainly for the uh, serviceable components of the battery pack, the ones that you might expect to have to access most frequently are available underneath these access plates. So again, the only things you can get at in the battery without dropping the battery. Okay, we've taken the lid off of the uh, Kia EV9 battery pack and you can see what it looks like on the inside. You can see there's a flame retardant material of some sort. We will be able to disclose that at a later date. Uh, this serves as both a thermal insulator in the event of uh, thermal runaway as well as uh, very likely an electrical insulator. Um, might be helpful in a crash situation. So when you look at the pack itself, there's lots of things to see. Uh, first of all, we have 38 different individual modules that are all electrically tied together in series. So each of these modules has four groups of three cells in parallel. So when you add that all up, that comes to the 100 kilowatt hour number that is the advertised capacity of this pack. And with that, we start to look at how the bus bars, as they're called in orange here, are arranged to uh, provide this series interconnection of all these different modules. So you can see some of it. You can see this module has two terminals on it. And one of them is an endpoint that goes up to this switch gear up front, which is where we make the actual electrical connections to the vehicle when the battery powers up. So if you follow it from here, you can see it goes from this battery terminal to that one, and it follows the sequence from here to this one, out of this one into that one. And you can see the little orange interconnecting bus bar that interconnects those two. Then out of this one to this one, all the way across down the line, and it crosses over to this one and goes down only as far as here, similar to where it came in. Because from there, it goes all the way down and makes a leap to this group, at which point it's then in series all the way across down the line, jump over here in series again, all the way to here, and then it crosses over, goes in through this large device that appears to be a fuse. And then it comes out of the fuse, goes back, continues into the pack through this module, daisy chain to this one, to this one, to that one, to that one, to that one. Another bus bar, come on down to this one, then to this one, this one. Finally, this one, this one, this one. And then this, this last connection, you can see this bus bar comes over and picks up this last module. That's your total of 38 modules that are the entire pack. Again, each with three cells in parallel as a group with four of those groups in series. Other identifying features inside the pack include these battery management system module connections. As you can see on each and every module, there's a small wire connection there that allows it to monitor the voltages of 
each of the four cell groups in each module, as well as provide temperature feedback for the battery management system that ultimately makes the decisions as to what the battery can do at any given moment. So down in this end, there's some more things to talk about. There is a battery management unit that actually is the supervisor for all the little battery management satellites that you saw at each module. And it's where the brains are for determining things like state of health, state of charge, um, how much current can be available at any given moment in both charge or discharge. Um, mentioned the fuse already. This would be a, uh, a serviceable, replaceable part. It is one of the components that you can get at through the compartments that are underneath with the other component being the battery management supervisor unit. So those are the two things that Hyundai or Kia um, expected to have to be serviceable in the field. So they made them easily accessible from outside. That's what's in the pack. You got it. Well, what I would have suggested had it not come up with maybe lifting it with you know pry bar. Yeah. But you got it. You don't need to. And again, what I do is I set it down upside down onto wherever you set it. Oh, look at that! The phone interface stayed behind. Okay, we're back to take a look at the EV9 battery tray after all the fun stuff has been removed. So we've taken out battery modules, the switch gear, the BMS. And what remains is the tray itself as a welded aluminum construction device that it is. And you can also see the thermal interface material that is left behind after the battery modules have been removed. So, you know, first, there's a lot of good things to say about this pack. Um, if you look at the welds, they're all reasonably good quality for, you know, volume production applications. Um, their whole vision of having a single cooler at the bottom of the battery tray is a really wonderful idea. And if you come around this side, you can see the inlet and outlet where it's significantly simplified the plumbing of the cooling system by having the single inlet and outlet and having the bottom of the battery tray itself be one giant cold plate. So that's a, a, a wonderful design and it significantly minimizes the complexity of that plumbing and the potential for leaks and maintenance concerns and things of that nature. So really when I dig hard, I can really find one fault with it. And it's related to the thermal interface material that you see here. You can see how thick it is. It's very thick. You know, I'm bo poking my finger down into it now. This is all gonna come out next anyway, it doesn't matter, but it's quite deep. And we've talked about thermal interface materials before on previous sessions and we should all know that the thicker it is the less effective it is basically but with the way they've designed the modules they have sort of a cavity that has to be filled and we'll take a look at the module here as a, an example of what I mean so here you can see at the edge of the module there's some of the thermal interface material hanging off of it but this whole area is filled with the thermal interface and it's quite thick and you shouldn't take too much away from the thickness, um, but instead contrast it to the idea of bottom edge cooling, which is a very common practice in pouch cell designs, is that it's become sort of the state of the art, if you will, especially with regard to cost, um, where it's uh, seen quite an evolution to reduce cost through the years, and now what remains is put some thermal interface material along the bottom edge of the cell and then hope that that edge is adequate enough to take the heat away. And my contention is that if you're building a car that is a commuter or utility vehicle, one where 
It doesn't have any extraordinary acceleration performance requirements. This is a great way to do things. I'm sure when this battery gets hot, the cooling system effectively takes the heat away, but it's gonna take its time doing so. And again, this is about the thickness of the thermal interface material. If they could just somehow create less distance, less thickness, less distance for that heat to travel through, it would be a, a much more effective cooling system and it could approach the ideal, if you will, that we've seen on other more higher performance applications where you can start, you can begin extracting heat from the cells during the acceleration itself. It can be that fast of a response that you can actually improve the acceleration performance through that fast response. In this case here, I don't think that that was part of their criteria for building the car, so it didn't need that. And quite frankly, um, Hyundai, Kia, they deserve some kudos for taking the 800 volt approach that was always intended, and that is to improve efficiency, reduce copper requirements, all the things that we know come with the change from 400 to 800 volts. They've done a wonderful job with that. Almost everyone else who's done this has erred on the side of increasing the performance of the vehicle instead, and not really realizing the reduction in material content that could have come with the transition to 800 volts. So the idea of using 800 volts for acceleration performance that's a no-brainer. But using it to get more miles per charge or you know, more miles per kilowatt hour, um, this is the approach they've taken and they've done a pretty good job of it. So with that, um, we will talk about the deep dive into the module on a future session, but uh, it's really all there is to say about the pack as it sits right now.